science with people. So it's really cool. Um, yeah, that we are having this and huge thanks to all my co-organizers because without their help and particularly Lucas help on setting up the web page, I think we would not have um, a symposium up and running or would not have had it for the next three months or so. So yeah, huge thanks to, to them. And yes, I'll be talking about my research on uh, pollination syndromes in Mariani uh, today. And then, um, well, some, some of the stuff will be old stuff that some of you probably already know. And some of it will be uh, new stuff that I have been um, doing recently and also some plans and perspectives where I would like to go taking pollination syndromes for, from Mariani a bit further um, to Malastomatesi. Yes, since not all of you come from a pollination biological background, I guess, I thought I first uh, introduced the concept of uh, pollination syndromes briefly. This is basically very nicely summarized uh, by the figure that you see. Um, pollination syndromes are suits or combinations of floral traits that appear repeatedly across different plant lineages that can be distantly related. Um, and they always appear in connection with specific functional pollinator groups. So perfect, perfect examples of convergent evolution, but not only in one trait, but in many traits, so in trait combinations. Um, this example here shows three of these functional pollinator groups, hummingbirds, bees, and moth. And um, it also represents three families. Maybe I collapse these, yeah. Um, shows three families, Ranunculaceae, Convolvulaceae, and uh, Caryophyllaceae. And you see that obviously um, the Caryophyllaceae species are more closely related within each other or with each other, each Caryophyllaceae species, but they converge in certain traits, most prominently flower color here, um, to adapt to different pollinator groups. Um, pollination syndromes are a very useful tool and used a lot to predict pollinators. This is particularly done in um, large plant groups, such as Malastomatesi, for example, but it's usually, I mean, it has been done in many other plant groups to predict pollinators if you cannot observe every plant species in the field to empirically verify um, its actual pollinator. Um, and I would say they are a very, very useful tool for analyzing flower evolution under an ecological perspective, but at a macroevolutionary scale. So you can always incorporate the impact of pollinators on floral evolution, um, studying many more species than you would be able to study if you had to empirically verify the pollinators of all species. But really importantly, um, empirical pollinator observations form the core and the basis of pollination syndromes. So these are really the, the starting point um, if you approach a system um, to work with pollination syndromes. Uh, there has been a lot of criticism on pollination syndromes, uh, mainly due to them focusing on um, very few traits, on simplifying complex interactions between plants and animals, often disregarding additional or secondary pollinators that are present. Um, yeah, there has been a lot of discussion on this and we're certainly still on the way of finding better methods of how to use and employ pollination syndromes. One matter that really complicates um, issues uh, is that pollinator mediated selection does not affect the entire floral phenotype equally, but um, does affect different traits differently and different pollinators may affect different floral traits differently. There's a really nice uh, recent review from Caruso et al comparing pollinator mediated selection um, across many different studies and they divided uh, floral traits into uh, so-called attraction traits. These are traits that make flowers attractive. So basically flower color, scent, and the reward the flower offers. Um, and the alternative would be, or the other set of traits uh, that commonly is addressed would be efficiency traits. So the traits that mediate the efficient pollen transfer, so the fit between the flower and the pollinator. And um, the, the image that you see here from a salvia flower visited by a bee 
uh, is a nice example. I mean, the flower is attractive to all of us. It's blue, so we are attracted by the color and probably by the size of the flower. Um, but the fit is really mediated by the stamen and pistil complex that touch down on the bee. And the bee that is too small or too large, or also a butterfly that would land on the flower and just stick in its, um, its uh, thin uh, mouth parts into the flower uh, would not act as a pollinator. And Caruso and Al could actually demonstrate or, or summarize uh, studies that have already shown that pollinator mediated selection is much stronger on these efficiency traits than on the attraction traits, as indicated here by the red circle. So when we look at flowers, we always have to keep in mind that some traits may evolve, may evolve faster um, and be less constrained than other traits, which are probably mediated, um, conserved by stabilizing selection. Um, I recently um, put together the uh, pollination syndrome or a lot of the pollination syndrome literature of the past 10 years and uh, tried to figure out what are the traits that are most commonly studied and how often are they um, identified as informative or as uninformative. And uh, they are classified here again, these red and orange traits are attraction traits and the blue traits are um, efficiency traits. And R means that the trait was recorded, I that it was um, reported as, uninform as informative, sorry, and U that it was recorded as uninformative. And one thing that I find really interesting is that color that is so attractive to all of us is um, reported as being uninformative or misleading in syndrome classification very often. For sure, there are many systems where color is really, really important and can discriminate between pollinators, but it's probably misleading to focus too much on some of these attraction traits since they may be really confounding. Um, reward type uh, had a high predictive accuracy and this is also something that I find um, pretty interesting. Another um, thing associated to pollination syndromes that I uh, find very exciting is the idea that pollinator shifts um, generate floral diversity. This is the classical Grant Stebbins model of flower evolution, where you think um, that a species or a, a species that is distributed across an, a, a larger area um, will um, adapt to the locally uh, varying pollinator communities, and this will cause um, floral diversification, obviously. And um, if one pollinator gets lost, um, that was ancestrally pollinating this group, um, a pollinator shift may happen to an alternative pollinator. And these pollinator shifts um, generally refer to shifts between functional pollinator groups, groups as exemplified here on the um, example of Aquilegia, where we have um, the blue circles represent bumblebee or bee pollinated species as this one, and then shifts to hummingbird pollination with this red flower, and um, several shifts to hawk moth pollination with these white flowers. The colors are really prominent here, but also um, you see uh, changes in the nectar spurs that these species have, in nectar concentration, in volume, um, but also in the uh, orientation of the flower. The hummingbird flowers are purely uh, pendant, the hawk moth pollinated flowers are upright. So, okay, this idea that pollinator shifts generate floral diversity is pretty well established. But what about groups um, that maintain the same pollination niche? How is their flower morphology affected and how is their floral diversity affected? Um, this is a graph of a recent study from Vasconcelos et al from 2019, where she looked at um, Mercia and actually identified huge um, or prominent floral uniformity across evolutionary time and across um, many, many species. Um, yeah, that basically retained the same floral morphology. And she hypothesized that these species have reached um, an adaptive plateau, so a very successful pollination strategy, very early in evolutionary time, and then conserved this floral morphology. When we think of melastomes, I don't think I have to show a melastome picture here. I mean, their flowers are crazily diverse, but we all know that most of them are pollinated by bees. And this is really exciting how we can have floral uniformity in one system and then such high floral university in another system that has also retained the same uh, pollination niche. Yeah, well, I'll start um, my, my results section basically today um, by focusing on Mariani. 
Um, they are a tribe of melastomes that is purely neotropical and contains well, depends on how many more species we're going to discover, but probably depend, um, contains 300 species, maybe less, maybe a bit more, I don't know. Um, highest diversity is in Ecuador and Colombia, but there are some particularly morphologically really important lineages in Brazil and the Antilles. They are distributed from lowland rainforests up to the Paramo areas. Most species are found in montane forests, in cloud forests but in particular. They can be shrubs, treelets, lianas in their growth form. And the pollinators are really diverse. We have uh, buzzing bees, hummingbirds, bats, rodents, and passerine birds. The questions that I'll be addressing today is how pollination syndromes in Mariani can be characterized, which traits do actually make them up, um, whether pollinator shifts contribute to floral diversity in Mariani. Then third, I will present you a very brief uh, case study um, on whether the pollination syndrome traits that I have identified as important in the group are really reliable um, predictors of actual pollinators. So this is an empirical uh, study that we recently did. And then more as an outlook and perspective, a study that I've started plunging into recently, whether pollination syndrome traits of Mariani are applicable across Melastomataceae. Okay, so how are pollination syndromes characterized in Mariani? Well, I, I said to characterize syndromes, we first have to know the actual pollinators. So what I did at the beginning of my PhD was uh, doing a lot of field work in uh, Ecuador and Costa Rica to document as many pollinators uh, for as many species as I could. And then in the next step, record uh, system-specific floral traits for these species, with always with the aim of finding traits that would indicate convergence to specific pollinator groups. And then the next step would be after identifying these traits to actually circumscribe um, the different syndromes. I used a really nice um, approach that I discovered in the pollination syndrome literature to uh, classify or characterize pollination syndromes, um, so-called random forest analyses, where you basically build decision trees. These are simply um, yeah, decision trees. So you ask questions and you classify whether this flower, flower uh, has this trait or not. Um, I'll briefly present you with a um, small decision tree. So imagine that the flowers that you see up, up here on the screen um, are your trait matrix. In total, I had, I think, 61 floral traits included in the trait matrix that were, importantly, not systematic characters, but really functional traits. So potentially pollination relevant floral traits. And one of the one common question you could ask would be, is the reward type pollen? And yes and no, you'd divide and split your data set. If you have strong questions that are important, you see large splits in the data set. This tells you that this is an important um, trait to differentiate your groups. Let's ask the next, the next question, which is um, whether the reward type is nectar. And again, we see a split in yes and no. And actually now we are already at the three pollination syndromes that I could um, uh, distinguish reliably for Mariani, which is a bee pollination syndrome, a passerine syndrome, and then a weird mixed vertebrate syndrome where hummingbirds, bats, and rodents, and even flower pierces um, occur as pollinators. Um, believe me, I really tried to tease apart this syndrome because all of these pollinators are usually um, regarded as different functional groups that would select for different traits. Um, but I was not able to do so because the nice thing of these random forest analyses is that you build many, many, many of these decision trees. You build forests out, forests out of single trees. And if you know the pollinators, um, you always try to predict species where you know the pollinators to its actual pollinator. Um, this way you can really verify and train the models that they actually, that their predictions would be accurate. And I was never able to distinguish species that are pollinated by hummingbirds and bats from species that are pollinated by hummingbirds and rodents, for example. So this is a nice approach of a more objective classification mechanism. And also the really nice thing um, of uh, decision trees is that they 
can differentiate that from good question, questions. If we ask, for example, in the bee pollinated flowers now, uh, whether the corolla is white, um, this trait will not help us at all to further differentiate um, the bee pollinated species. So they will all still be lumped together because this trait is simply not important in the group. So yeah, um, the power of differentiating informative from uninformative traits. And once you have these uh, syndromes established and you know the traits, you can actually use the syndromes to predict pollinators through the same algorithms, starting from the floral traits to uh, predict pollinators for species where you simply cannot observe or could not observe due to time constraints, um, the pollinators. Obviously it would be nice if all of us could just be in the field <laughs> and do so much field work. Um, but yeah, I fear this is not gonna happen, at least not anytime soon. Um, yeah, I said that we can differentiate um, important from unimportant characters or traits. Um, this basically shows what the random forests, forests do. Um, don't try to read the small uh, print. This is simply a graph of the 61 floral characters ranked by their importance and you calculate an, an index, the so-called Gini index, and the traits that come up on the top here um, in circled in red, those traits are the ones that are most discriminating um, for your uh, syndromes or for the groups that you want to find. And in Mariani, the five most important ones were the reward type, the pollen expulsion mechanism, so the mechanism of pollen release, the orientation of the flower, um, the relative position of the corolla opening um, and the stigma, and petal gloss, so shininess basically of um, petals. And uh, if you try to identify some of the classically used syndrome traits like color, I'm sorry, I'm color bashing, bashing here. I don't know, it comes up somewhere down here. So there are many more traits, at least in this group, that are more characteristic uh, of syndromes. I will now uh, briefly describe the three syndromes that I could um, identify. Those who've already seen this talk, please bear with me. There will be other stuff coming later. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, overall, there was relatively low importance of many of the uh, classical pollination syndrome traits that are useful in other groups, but not in Mariani at least, and high importance of the pollen expulsion mechanism and the reward type. Let's start by looking at the bee pollinated species, which, um, as I have uh, said before, are super diverse. Um, and actually, the only fact that really unites the bee pollinated species is that they offer pollen as a reward and that this pollen can be released through bus pollination, so through the application of vibrations to the flowers. Um, well, and the huge floral variability most likely comes from the fact that there are so many different bees that interact with these flowers, different size, but also in how they behave on the flowers. Um, for example, if you look at the small video on top, I hope it's running a bit more quickly. This is an Adelobotris flower that is relatively small with a Melibona costarricensis bee that um, went there to bust the stamens. And you see that it basically crouches on top of the entire Andresium and then buzzes the stamens to release pollen. Um, while in the image here on the bottom, uh, you see um, most likely a centrist bee buzzing um, Mariana Hernandoi um, by biting into the stamen appendages and buzzing each stamen singularly. So, of course, this interaction is really different from the other interaction. And on the small graph and Rieta flowers that you see in the um, picture A, um, bees also just crouch upon the entire Andresium and buzz the flowers. So, um, yeah, one one thing that I'm that I'm that I, I will be doing now is to dig deeper into this um, bee syndrome to better disentangle uh, the interactions between the flowers and then um, the different bee pollinators and how they interact with the flowers. This is really difficult though because in many of these montane uh, bee pollinated species like in the nice uh, Mariania hernandoi that you see here, pollination or visitation rates are really low and you may spend several days sitting in front of a flower um, without a pollinator coming by. So. Yeah, I guess some of you will have made these experiences and yeah, it can be quite frustrating. Um, the second syndrome that I could delineate is this peculiar mixed vertebrate syndrome where um, the reward type has changed from pollen to nectar, which um, is secreted by 
uh, well, actually by different mechanisms in some species by ruptures that occur in the filament. So uh, pre-anthetic flowers uh, don't have these ruptures yet. And then after approximately six hours of anthesis, these filament ruptures appear and nectar oozes out. And some uh, secrete uh, nectar through small ruptures on the stamen appendages. So different mechanisms, again, even in closely related species. But anyways, the pollinators will have to stick their mouth, mouth parts here uh, into the flower between the stamens to lick out the nectar, which is uh, here the um, area that is shaded in gray. Um, and then there are some other adaptations um, to this pollen release mechanism that functions more like a salt shaker, basically. Um, because the, uh, the stamen properties have changed. Tecal walls have, soft, have become softer and thinner and can be easily deformed from the outside. So when a hummingbird, for example, sticks in its bill, uh, pollen is released relatively easily. And also these flowers are always pendants. Um, yeah, I have a, two videos again of a hummingbird um, visiting a flower. The stigma is actually up here in the upper part of the corolla. Um, and yeah, I always wonder how the hummingbird actually touches the stigma because very often I think it does not. Um, yeah, and bats come during nighttime. All of the species that I have observed up to now have always have a diurnal and a nocturnally active um, visitor. Um, yeah, this is going to be interesting to see whether this applies also to other groups of melastomes or whether there's a way of excluding nocturnal um, visitors, for example, or pollinators. And the third um, pollination syndrome is passerine uh, pollination, where again the reward type has changed from pollen um, to food body rewards that are actually contained uh, in these in the stamens, in the stamen appendages. Um, I mean, stamen appendages are really important in many um, Malostomataceae, as you all know, and in the genus Axinea and also some Marianias, these appendages are, have become bulbous and inflated. And they are filled with um, vasculature that is rich in sugars, but also with air. And so the birds come and forage to eat the stamens since they are sugary, but also when you compress the bulbous appendages, um, the air that is contained inside the bulbous appendage um, flushes out the pollen grains from um, the tiki and they get expelled um, through the pore and land on the bird's um, face. You see this uh, nicely in this, in this video. Um, where um, a tanager um, feeds on flowers of uh, Axinea confusa in, in, in Ecuador, sorry, um, picking out the stamens one by one from the flower. Yeah, and you see how it touches against uh, the stigma, which is here um, when it inserts its head into the flower again to take out the next stamen. Okay, so these are the three pollination syndromes that I could characterize or have characterized so far for Mariani. And now the question is, do pollinator shifts contribute to floral diversity in Mariani? So first, if we look at um, how these pollination syndromes are distributed across um, the phylogeny, um, we see that bee pollination in blue is um, actually ancestral and most widespread, no surprise. And um, pollinator shifts have occurred repeatedly and independently of each other um, across the tree. So there are multiple shifts into the mixed vertebrate syndrome in salmon and multiple shifts into the passerine uh, pollination syndrome in yellow. Uh, I've estimated the number of syndrome transitions and at least from this small phylogeny, we should have approximately three shifts into the mixed vertebrate syndrome and um, six shifts into the passerine uh, syndrome. No or very little support uh, of reversals. Um, but I have to say here, this is just um, 60 species of the Mariani phylogeny. And um, well, Fabian has a bigger phylogeny, which um, I hope we will be able to work on soon so that um, maybe then the number of shifts will actually increase that we will be seeing uh, once we start looking at more species and have better coverage of the clade. Yeah, well, what I did then was um, producing a floral morphospace. So basically um, collapsing the floral trait matrix that was the source of these random forest analyses that I've talked about before, um, reducing the dimensionality 
of this huge data set with 60 trades to um, yeah to be able to represent um, the data sets. So I'm sure you all know PCAs and NMDS and whatever, and this is basically the same um, a principal coordinate analyses um, where points that cluster together um, are more similar to each other than points that are far away from um, yeah from the others. Um, and this um, morphospace also shows um, or represents the three syndromes. Actually, when you look at the space in three dimensions, um, the different syndromes, which are again represented by different colors here, really sit in uh, different areas of phenotypic space. So even what looks close here on the first two dimensions is very far apart in three dimensions. And the interesting thing is, so first, yes, we see what we would assume under a pollination syndrome hypothesis that um, species with different pollinators group in different areas of shape space, but also, and this was the really exciting thing to see for me, um, that the B pollination syndrome is morphologically um, the most diverse or the most um, disparate. Basically, it covers the largest area of shape space and a larger area than the two vertebrate pollinated uh, pollination syndromes. So although vertebrate pollination obviously contributes to um, increasing floral diversity in the group, floral, floral diversity simply within this B syndrome, within the same uh, functional pollinator group is bigger. And this is um, pretty interesting, particularly when you think back to the result that um, Thais Vasconcelos had on um, floral uniformity in Murcia. Um, yeah, I've here modeled um, the morphospace through evolutionary time, uh, starting um, 25 million years ago, and you basically on the uh, y and x-axis again see the morphospace that you've seen before, um, and follow how the, the colors are the same, so blue is bee, um, yellow is passerine bird, and salmon is um, mixed vertebrate, um, and see how they um, start diversifying, the time bar is here on top. So first you see the bees diversifying, then the pollinator shifts happening pretty late in this short evolutionary time slot that we looked at yet. Um, and um, you see that the syndromes with different pollinators again converge in different areas of shape space, but then the huge area that is covered by the bee pollinated species. And this relates to this idea of an um, adaptive plateau that Mariani and probably all melastomes, all bee pollinated melastomes are wandering upon. So huge floral diversity, which accommodates the big, big diversity of different um, bees. And there are some really nice um, studies that have come out recently, for example, by um, Mesquita Neto et al. Actually, sorry, I think it's from 2018 and not 19, um, but that looked more closely at um, bee behavior in uh, bus pollinated flowers and in bus pollinated melastomes to better understand how this huge morphological um, diversity um, can arise and probably also uh, function. Uh, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, well, so now I'm done with old stuff basically and um, will present you a small study um, that I could work uh, at uh, recently, where I actually went on to test the validity of the pollination syndromes um, that I had delineated to see whether their predictive power is accurate. And I chose uh, one species or species group that was predicted as passerine pollinated. This is uh, Mariania macrophylla. This is a group of a couple of species, for example, Mariania peltata and Mariania um, franciscana from uh, Ecuador. Um, I did this together with uh, Jose Miguel or Jose Miguel Valverde Espinosa from the University of Costa Rica. This was his licentiate thesis. So he did he did all the field work, go to the field and actually observe pollinated to verify whether the species was actually uh, passerine pollinated. Um, in the Axinea species where passerine pollination occurs, we find fresh flowers that have stamens uh, present in the flower and then flowers where all stamens are removed. So if passerine pollination was also happening in uh, Mariania macrophylla, we would expect to see the same. And Jose actually found the same, um, that 
fresh anthetic flowers look like this flower, the, the flower on the left, um, but then flowers that have been visited, stamens have bas basically been eaten out. The interesting thing, however, is that Mariana macrophylla is very strongly heteranthrous, and the birds only eat, eat one set of stamens that are huge and bulbous and inflated, and the second set of stamens, which is much smaller, is left inside the flower. So it looks like this set of stamens has, I don't know, completely lost its function. At the beginning, I thought maybe this is a system that is in a transition between bird and bee pollination. Maybe bees would still come to buzz the smaller flowers. This would have been really great because these examples of uh, transition stages are super rare um, in flowering plants. But unfortunately, we haven't seen um, any bees buzzing these flowers yet. So I fear um, it's only birds. And yeah, maybe these things really lost the function. And here is the proof from some amazing videos um, that Jose made. Um, filming tanagers in the field that eat stamens out of the flowers in um, Mariania macrophylla just the same way as they do it in the Axinia species. So yay, um, at least in this species group the syndromes seem to be working and seem to be reliable. Um, I hope to be able to test many more systems um, in future. Okay, and now um, I'm almost done. This is um, more an, an outlook perspective, um, investigating the idea whether pollination syndrome traits of Mariani are applicable across Malostomatesi. So when we look at um, this snapshot of um, floral diversity, you really start to wonder. And yeah, I'm, I'm wondering a lot. This is actually um, a two-step process now. Um, first, I have a student, Katharina, who is uh, currently doing a literature review on the um, yeah, on documented pollinators in Malostomatesi, and we are, when we can, adding um, observations from field studies. So we started with Renner's 1989 paper and um, conducted a web of science search. So she has approximately 164 articles now um, that she's reviewing. And well, there are approximately 300 species in the matrix now, it's probably gonna go up. So if any of you is interested in contributing and collaborating, um, I'd be super happy to do this together because this is a, a big thing. Um, so maybe we can, can even arrive at more species. Um, pollinators are diverse as we expect. Um, bees, bats, passerines, rodents, uh, hummingbirds, and then of course there are these amazing um, systems in Brazil where we have um, generalist uh, po pollinators as well, or, or generalist species that are visited also by flies and wasps and so on. And the um, second step that one of my master students is working on right now, uh, Constantine Copper, is studying pollination relevant floral traits in um, selected species. The aim, of course, would be to study those in um, the species where we have um, empirical pollinator observations for. Um, Constantine, for his thesis now, targeted 37 species in the tribes Miconiae, Blakey, Tibuchina, and Melostome. So these um, clades where we know or try to we know that pollinator shifts have also happened. Um, and he's going very much into detail, um, starting from the traits uh, of Mariani and then extending, um, well, we, we already started realizing that we have to extend the trait matrices since there are new traits that seem to be important and informative. He's using both um, SEM and micro CT techniques. And some patterns, I guess, are probably, well, not surprising to any of you. This would be um, that many of the um, shifted species have more pendant closed uh, corollas, so changes in corolla shape and orientation, but also changes in petal cell shapes seem to be really important. And yeah, here I would say stay tuned for Constantine seminar. I hope that at some point in future, he'll be able to um, talk about his findings in this um, uh, online seminar as well. Yes, and to wrap up, um, how are pollination syndromes characterized in Mariani? Um, well, system-specific traits work much better than traditional pollination syndrome traits, most likely due to the ancestral buzz morphology in the group, which re required very different um, changes and adaptations. Most important are the pollen expulsion mechanism and the reward type, but also some shape attributes, such as the um, corolla shape. Um, yes, pollinator shifts 
do contribute to floral diversity in Mariani, um, but the bee bus syndrome itself is so diverse um, and even more diverse um, than the other syndromes. And we have evidence from Mariania macrophylla that the traits that we um, identified as important in differentiating syndromes do actually work and are reliable predictors of pollination syndromes or of pollinators. Um, and as for whether pollination syndrome traits of Mariani are applicable across Melastomataceae, well, the first impression is yes and no. Some, like the pollen expulsion mechanism and the reward type, definitely work, or the corolla shape and petal cell shapes. Um, but there will be others, uh, more refined characters regarding the androecium, which I'm sure we will have to refine. And as a last statement, maybe bee bus pollination is amazing. <laughs> There's so much to do. And yeah, with this, I'm at the end of my talk and have many people to thank uh, Fabian and Darren who have been supportive throughout the last years. And uh, yeah, without your floral material and um, all the phylogeny parts that you had already built, none of this here would have been possible. Then obviously, um, Jörg Schönenberger, who uh, was my PhD supervisor. Um, Diana Fernandez, who is my most important collaborator in Ecuador for doing field work, then many field stations, and yes, all the co-organizers of the Melostome um, seminar series, and you all for coming, and I'm very happy to, um, yeah, have the discussion started. So, great, Agnes. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat there are already some questions there for you nope. the chat you if you go to the bottom yes. next to share screen there's a chat little window um, yep so i start seeing the first question by darren i think yeah what is the quality of the smaller things of mariana macrophylla maybe not viable yes um that's a good question there's hardly or there's very very um little pollen inside um, we haven't done viability tests yet, but maybe you are completely right and it's already lost its viability. Um, oh yeah, Jose, Jose was, was there <laughs> and answered the question, great. Um, then is there any indicator that the large bee pollinated group can be further subdivided as pollinated by different groups of bees? Yes. Um, Julie, I absolutely um, say yes. Um, um, particularly since the bees interact differently with, with the flowers. And I think this applies to all Melastomataceae as we start seeing now from different studies that looked at single systems more in detail. Um, okay, more question. <laughs> Did I answer everything? I don't know. Yes, Vini, ask something. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all here. <laughs> Agnes, thank you for your amazing talk. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you talking. We, we are always uh, reading our papers here in our group. I'm and reading it's, yours too. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to see you talking. Uh, Agnes, I, I'm, really, I, I'm really interested in the... Um, in the why uh, these plants change the pollinators, uh, why why there is there are some shifts in pollinators, and um, maybe one of one of the reasons is the pollen limitations in high altitude. So my question is, if this um, other syndrome is is more common, what is your gut feeling about this? If it, they are more common in the high altitudes. And the second question, very quick, is do the bees uh, visit in the upside down position, the mediana flowers, as you're showing mm -hmm. one of your pictures? This is mm -hmm. crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, okay. starting with your second question, yes, the bees do visit the flowers upside down. The bees really don't seem to care at all how um, they visit the flowers. They can do it upside down or the other way around. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the altitudinal relation, yes, 100%. Um, um, this is something um, that is sort of in the pipeline. Um, and that 
my new project is going to be about more, um, but these pollinator shifts relate in Mariani, uh, relate 100% with growth at higher elevations and seem to be doing so in um, Blakey and um, well, Malastomati as well with Brachiotum just occurring at high elevations. And well, from Iconia, you probably know better than I do. <laughs> there it seems to be a bit different, but yeah. So otherwise in those other groups, it, there's a strong relation with growth at high elevations. And um, also bees are really inefficient as pollinators at high elevations because their abundances are just so, so low. Um, yeah, that they basically, I mean, they would transfer pollen, but there are simply very few bees. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then I see another question. Um, variation in entomophology and pollen presentation schedules. Um, I, I'm not sure now whether you are just referring to the bee pollinated species, Rosa, um, but at least there is very, very strong variation in entomophology. Um, between syndromes, less so within syndromes, but also within syndromes. One really prominent feature that I think is involved in the bus pollination uh, process and in pollen dosing is whether um, tecal structures or tiki are corrugated or not, because if they are, the pollen cannot fly a straight direction, but has to fly somehow a zigzag pattern. It could also be, however, that this corrugation enhances the vibrational properties of, of stamens. So this is something that we try to figure out right now because it's very strange. Um, and pollen um, presentation schedules. Um, I have noticed a weird pattern. So if any of you has, I would love to learn about it. Um, when I collect flowers to count pollen grains very early in the morning, usually I count less pollen than two hours later um, when they have already been visited by bees which is strange because after they've already been visited, there should be less. But I think that the buzzing happening or something maybe releases some pollen somehow. I don't know. I mean, there was this really interested, uh, interesting paper recently about the holy sporangiet uh, anthus. So maybe that's related somehow. But yeah, I don't know. Have, have any of you ever had this? It's so frustrating when you do the particle counting and then there are fewer pollen grains than before. <laughs> So then Isabella is asking these slits on stamens and you have looked at nectary stomatas as I have found for some species. Um, yeah, uh, I guess it's, is it Isabella Varasin asking? I think I've read your paper a million times. <laughs> And I always tried to make as nice stainings as you did. My, my stainings would never become as nice and red as yours did. <laughs> um, so on, on Mariania tomentosa and Mariania flomoides and so on, I could never, um, so I, I have these um, horizontal slits on the backside of the filaments. Those only form during anthesis. They are not there in, in buds or in flowers that just open in the morning but they, they um, come or appear um, about six hours into anthesis. Um, and you really see, so I had a lot of them, of the flowers in jars to see whether pollen, uh, sorry, nectar oozes out of these structures. And yes, it does. So you really see the nectar droplets forming on these structures. And then for other uh, nectar producing species, um, you could actually see nectar droplets sitting on the appendages. And there are very, very small, looks like intercellular slits on the appendages that form um, where nectar seems to be coming out. Um, yeah, other than that, I have not seen anything. Oh, yeah, some species have stomata on the nectar as well, but I think those may be related to scent production actually, because these are often species that are very strongly scented. Oh, 
Okay. So any more questions? Anybody wants to volunteer? Oh, Alan, I see Alan. Unmute yourself. We don't. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I, I put it on chat, but it, it got overlooked, I guess. Um, I was asking about uh, the reproductive system, whether most of the species in the tribe are, are self-compatible or self-incompatible. Um, those that I've tested up to now, this is just six, um, those are self-compatible. They are not apomictic, but self-compatible. Huh, and actually, when you when you cut out stamens um, and then leave them open to be visited, um, their pollen or, or they produce much fewer fruits. So I think they are selfing a lot, actually. Hmm. And when you think of the pollen clouds that fly around, um, yeah, they definitely contribute to self pollen deposition within the flower. I, I wonder if there's, if anybody's looked as to whether there's any correlation with relative heterozygosity or homozygosity, if, if there is a lot of um, self-pollination. Are you aware of any studies? Yeah, I'm like fighting that? with a huge population genomic data set just now. <laughs> <laughs> and hope to finish it up soon. Um, and actually, um, well, to be all honest, depending on the uh, analyses that we run and the algorithms that we set, homo or heterozygosity is equally high or lower or higher. Huh. All, I, all I can say is that it is not, um, it is not consistently different between um, pollination systems. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm still in the fine tuning of, of this uh, data set. Well, I'll look forward to seeing the paper. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we have no more takers, it's been amazing. Uh, I think that Lucas has a couple announcements and then uh, we'll move it from there. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all. Uh, I'm aware that we have a couple of problems and for some people that could not uh, enter at the seminar, don't know why, so we're going to work on it. Uh, your feedback is really important for us. It's our first seminar, so I think that we're going to improve it as the time pass, okay? So, um, we are talking with our next uh, person. We're going to do the seminar next month. And as soon as we have the, all the information, we're going to send you. Okay, so thank you. So, so the, next, the next seminar is uh, Fernando Silveira. Yeah. Uh, and we'll be talking about fruit uh, and as resources, areas as resources in, in milestones uh, for, you know, as an ecological resource and so forth. Uh, yeah. But Fernando will think give us more details. Uh, the date will probably be also either Wednesday or Thursday about this same time, the first week of October, uh, will depend a little bit on Fernando's um, commitments that week, and, but we'll be sending out an email within the next week or so. Mm -hmm. And, and we I have hope the, the information on the website, yeah. just, just to let you know, yeah. you can check there. And I hope that this recording all will work out and we'll be able to post the, this on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. Also, the, the, the video will be published in our, our website and I'm going to send you by email also, okay? I have a proposal. Okay. Why not two times a, a month instead of once a month? I think it's nice, everybody likes, we have a lot to talk. We have, we have it's good to meet everybody. Everybody else, I would suggest for us to, to, to double the, the dose. Are you volunteering to give a talk? No, 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 no. Ah. <laughs> we need more volunteers for talk. Yeah. 
<laughs> go to for two two times a month. <laughs> yeah, it's a, we discussed it before, and we thought that it might be a good a good option. The only problem is that we have we need volunteers, so it doesn't matter if if you are a student or a professor. We're happy to hear about your research, so. Let's talk about it. Maybe, maybe it's a, a good, a good opportunity, right? Thank you, Renat. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I will kill the meeting in about a minute, but thank you, Agnes, again, and uh, yep. thank you, Lucas, and thank you everybody for being here. And we'll see you at the next talk. Soon. Yeah, and Renato is right. One month to go. That's so long. Oh. <laughs> Well, maybe after that, if we get more people in, in, in the yeah. pipeline, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll increase the, the um, frequency. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.